regular town council. Uh, may we have the call of the roll, please? Chairman Lynch. Present. Councilor Backer. Here. Councilor Dill. Councilor Lennon. Here. Councilor McKinney. Here. Councilor Rowe. Here. Councilor Swift Kayak. Here. I just want to say, uh, Councillor Dill called me earlier this evening. She is suffering from the flu. Okay, Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Okay. First item on our agenda is uh, the minutes from our February 11th, 2008 meeting. I have a motion. Move to accept. Is there second. A second. Any discussion? All in favor? Show that to be 6-0, please. Okay, the next item is reports and correspondence. And uh, are there any reports or correspondence? Paul? I have a couple of items. The Greater Portland Councils of, uh, Council of Governments is, um, has just approved, or actually the regional uh, coalition has just approved the Forensic Crime Lab, and the, the county is on board, and the, the county being the uh, communities the Sheriff's Department supports, as well as the six communities surrounding Greater Portland. That's a pretty exciting. Um, thing because it's, it's going to make, um, it's not going to lower costs necessarily, but it lowers costs in the sense that all of these communities are sharing in the cost of the crime lab, but it should help us solve crimes more quickly and, you know, help improve the quality of life in the region in that sense. So I just wanted to share that with you. Another item is that um, on March 21st at the Muskie School, the, um, we're going to hold our first economic uh, development forum. It's about uh, sustainable uh, energy, and uh, it's going to be, uh, I guess our guest speaker is from uh, Oregon. He's an expert on, th on the subject, and we'll have a panel discussion. And the public is invited, as well as you know, any, any of the uh, government officials. Thank you. So you'll, you'll hear more about it. Great. Thank you. Thanks. And there are other reports? Jim. Thank you, Madam Chairman. The uh, Town Council Finance Committee uh, just came from its meeting this evening, and the purpose of the meeting was to uh, consider targets for spending for our, tar uh, for our departments during this budget season. And uh, I think probably the easiest way to address this for the public would just be to run down uh, the agenda very quickly. Uh, I had placed, put the agenda into the form of four questions. The first question was, is it the Finance Committee's desire to employ budget targets? And we had a consensus uh, response that yes to that, uh, to that question. Second question, if so, what form will targets assume? For example, spending targets, targets on tax rates, or some other target? Um, here we kind of decided that we were interested in both of these aspects, given the uh, particularly trying economic times and, and the, the uh, situation that we're all facing uh, with our economy. Um, the third uh, question was, at what level will targets be established? And here, uh, we had a majority opinion that we wanted a spending target for our departments, uh, or would advise our, our departments uh, to spend no more than 4.3% over last year's budget. And we were also uh, would not want to see our tax rates <coughs> by more than 10%. So we wanted to keep our tax rates less than 10%, and we want our departments to look at uh, spending no more than 4.3% from last year's budget. Um, that concludes my report. Okay, thank you, Jim. Sarah? I just want to give a quick update on the Office of the Energy Committee. I'm just going to read because I don't want to leave anything out. Quickly, the goals of the committee are to identify alternative energy goals provide cost savings, reduce fossil fuel reliance, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, serve as a model for other communities, <coughs> tie into an, the educational program, obtain community buy-in, coordinate with energy conservation, incorporate lessons learned, and make recommendations to the town. Uh, very quickly, essentially what the committee's done so far is uh, talk extensively to Ernie McVeigh, the poor man gets grilled every meeting, about exactly how the town uses its energy now. So we've talked about school buildings, municipal buildings, um, boilers, 
um, numbers, he brings in charts and graphs, and I feel that the committee has a pretty good handle now on how fossil fuel and the energy is used in Cape. Next month, they're going to have Bob Malian to talk about vehicles. Um, additionally, they've divided the committee up into subcategories, so there are people researching wind, alternative, tidal energies, et cetera, et cetera, and they each month come in with a report to the rest of the committee on sort of possible interesting alternative energy. Um, they attend uh, expos and, and committees, that one, uh, around the state. There's a big one coming up in Boston this month, and they come back to reports to report to the committee. Steve Linnell, who is our representative from the Greater Portland Council of Governments, uh, is incredibly helpful. He keeps us current on events and progress throughout the state, and he organizes the meetings, and there's reams of material sent to all of us between meetings. Um, essentially, the, the goal is, at the end of the year, to submit um, a comprehensive report to the town that um, does several things. They want to begin by reporting on CAPE's current energy use, um, and then talk primarily about possible conservation, reduction, and reusing of energy sources throughout the town that can lead to cost savings and reduced energy. In other words, they're very interested in not the big ticket glorified things, but just the small, how, how can we tighten this, how can we get a little bit more out of it. Um, and then secondly, short-term alternative energy suggestions with a cost analysis of upfront cost versus long-term savings. And then larger, bigger picture, long-term solutions. Um, and finally, a town statement of mission and philosophy for moving forward. And that would include a roadmap for the next decade of Cape Elizabeth's energy use. Um, including planning, use, and a gradual movement away from dependence on fossil fuel. The committee welcomes input from the town citizens. You can go to the website, you can email or phone any of the members, and of course they uh, welcome anybody to attend any of the meetings which are posted on the website. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah, and thanks for serving on that committee. Um, I have two things. Uh, first, uh, Cynthia Dill did ask me to note that there will be a tax forum here at Town Hall on March 13th at 7 p.m. She has um, brought in a whole variety of people representing um, various um, special and pu public interests, including, uh, I know, our own Ann Swift Kayata, who is speaking. Are you wearing your town council hat or your main municipal association hat? I always have my town council hat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I, am, I think she's invited me as the president of MMA. Okay. So that forum will be here March 13th um, at 7 p.m. And um, I think we would be remiss tonight if we didn't um, recognize the passing of uh, Gilly Jordan, who um, passed away about 10 days ago. Um, it was in this chamber about seven years ago that Gilly was... Um, given the Ralph Gould Award for Community Service. And um, I, it seemed like half the town was at the funeral or the funeral home in the days before. Um, but I also looked around that group and I thought, that's the half the town that was born before 1960. Um, and so I wanted to just read um, for the record um, what we said about Gilly when we gave him the Ralph Gould Award um, for those folks who may not have known him, um, but I want to make sure that everyone understands his contributions um, to our public life. Um, Gilly uh, Jordan was um, one of those citizens who stepped forward whenever there was a need in Cape Elizabeth. He was one of the founders of the Cape Elizabeth Rescue Unit. He was a volunteer with the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department for over 40 years. He served as captain of the Engine One Company. He served on many truck committees, most notably the committee um, for the current ladder truck that is used by the fire department. Gilly was chairman of the Facilities 2000 Committee, overseeing the planning of the new public works garage and other improvements at the Gull Crest property. As head of this committee, he also guided um, the committee to the decisions to renovate the former public works garage into what we now know as the fire station and um, the new police station. He also chaired the Community Center Study Committee. In addition to these very public efforts, 
Gilly also very quietly helped with the planting of flowers at Town Hall and at the Public Safety Building over the years. He not only donated the flowers each year, but also planted them with the help of his wife, Barbara. Gilly Jordan was a person who dreams of what could be accomplished and then set out to make sure that those dreams became a reality. He truly acted in the spirit of Ralph Gould in placing Cape Elizabeth at the center of his priorities, um, a good part of his life. So it is with great sadness that we note Gilly's um, passing and extend our deepest sympathies to Barbara and to his children and to their families. So that's all I have for tonight. Town manager's report? Here oh, Jim's going. oh, yes, Jim. Uh, Sorry. Before we leave that uh, kind of down note, I would like to quote oh. the passing of another uh, longtime high-profile high Cape Elizabeth resident, uh, former longtime coach and teacher at Cape Elizabeth High School, Leroy Rand. He was my uh, junior year U.S. history teacher. Uh, he was a soccer, basketball, baseball coach, very highly regarded, not only in Cape Elizabeth, but uh, in the greater Portland area and statewide. He's, he's a member of the, the uh, main, sport, uh, main Baseball Hall of Fame. And uh, Leroy was one of those rare individuals that gave of himself. Uh, before the days of the community services program, Leroy would show up on the middle school field and at the Little League field down on Shore Road, and just the kids would gather and they'd play. He, just, he was that kind of uh, magnetic person. And uh, I know the whole community is saddened to hear his passing. Thank you. And thank you, Jim. Thank you. Michael? I would just like to agree with the previous comments, and uh, I think it's a good point to note. So thank you. Yes. And you have no further report tonight? OK. Um, now it's that point in our agenda when we hear um, from citizens who are here to discuss items not on our agenda, and I know we have Girl Scouts here, um, and I know they have homework. I know there are other people here, but in light of Girl Scouts having to go home to do homework, perhaps we can hear from the Girl Scouts first. And if you could state your name, and um, do we addresses too, right? Not, not for not for minors. Okay, <laughs> I wasn't sure about that. <laughs> Hello, my name is Kitty Taycash, and I am one of eleven junior girls in Troop 1402. Uh, we are here today to tell you a little bit about our troop and um, about our next upcoming event. Thanks. Um, Hello, my name is Grace Stack, and. Like Katie said, Troop 1402 has been together for 11 years, and we currently have 11 girls who are all juniors at Cape Elizabeth High School. We've done many projects over the years, such as supporting a Kenyan woman um, go to nursing school through paying her tuition, um, collecting and disposing of Christmas trees each year, um, volunteering at the Root Center and the Special Olympics, and almost all of our girls in our troop are currently working on or have achieved their Gold Award project. And next summer, we are planning on going to an international scouting house in Switzerland to learn and work with scouts from all across the world. Hello, my name is Ariana Nealand. Um, the event we are planning is a benefit dinner on May 17th at St. Bart's Church. Uh, the theme is to honor women who have made a difference in our community and deserve recognition. We are seeking nominations and will choose a woman to be honored in early April. If you can think of any women who are deserving, please let us know. The price of tickets isn't official yet, but we're guessing around $10 per person, um, and proceeds will fund troop activities. Again, the date will be May 17th. Hi, I'm Emily Richardson, and I live at 34 Valley Road. Um, we will be selling tickets for the dinner soon, and people can submit nominations and reserve tickets. In the meantime, by emailing troop1402 at gmail.com or sending a note to 34 Valley Road, and those addresses will be posted in the Cape Courier and on the town's cable channel. Um, does anyone have any questions? Any questions for the Girl Scouts? No. Okay. Right. Well, thank you. well, thank you, Katie, Grace, Ariana, and Emily, and uh, good luck uh, choosing. There are a lot of women in this town who have done and continue to do a lot of really <laughs> Great thing, so it's going to be a tough choice to single out and honor just one person. I think we can all think of 
pen. It, um, so I would just encourage the public to contact you if they have nominees. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to the council? Hi, I'm Mary Page. I'm owners of Rudy's of the Cape uh, at 517 Ocean House Road. And I'm here to ask for an immediate decision to the amendment in the BA setback. I am scheduled for the March 18th planning board meeting for site plan review to expand my seating and hours of operations, which is, which is already recognized by the state and accepted. I've had many meetings with Maureen, Bruce Smith, and Mike McGovern and have prepared and done everything requested for site plan review at an expense of over $10,000. So far, new findings today by the town attorney suggested the amendment for the BA zone setbacks need to be in place in order to proceed with this process. If I would have known this, I would never would have started the process. Maureen, Bruce Smith, and Mike were also all unaware of this as of today. I am asking that this amendment be implemented as soon as possible so that we can stay in business. I would also like to read you something that is included in the planning board packets that you may not be aware of, aware of. It's called third places. And the phrase third places derives from considering our homes to be of first places in our lives and our work places are second. And what suburbia cries for are the means for people to gather easily, inexpensively, regularly, and pleasurably. A place at the corner, a real-life alternative to television. Third places help care for the neighborhood. People who operate these third places are often called social observers or described as public characters. They seem to know everybody in the neighborhood. They keep an eye on local kids and what they're up to. They do favors for local customers and they keep regulars up to date on all of local matters. Third places also serve as gathering spots when emergencies or disasters occur. People want and need to be with other people in these situations to help and support each other and to decide on courses of action. While third places often seem to depend on a mysterious chemistry, planners can help foster the condition in which they might emerge. One way is by implementing the policies prevalent in so many zoning cords of prohibiting commercial spaces such as taverns, coffee houses, donut shops, and the likes from locating where people live. These policies don't discourage third places, they virtually prevent them. You can't have a neighborhood tavern and you can't have a neighborhood coffee house that's not located in a neighborhood. We're asking that the simple amendment be implemented as soon as possible because if not, my family future in this town, in my town, in this town, and the future of this only third place will disappear. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Michael, could you? Oh, I'm sorry. Come, I'm sorry. Come right up. No, I didn't have a question. I was going to ask Michael to um, explain what would be involved in, but no, I'd like to, we'll have. Uh, My name is Carl Pearson, uh, I live in Fowler Road. Uh, it was also interesting to have a segue of economic development, energy, greenhouse gases, and Gilly Jordan, because uh, I'm also the new proprietor of Jordan's Lawn and Garden. And uh, it came about rather quickly. Uh, Gilly was being courted by another interest from away and uh, wasn't too happy about that. And I think as his family can attest, it was kind of a good match since I've known Gilly a long time, served on many of those boards and committees that you mentioned as a counselor. Uh, and then relative to what Mary's speaking about, I had the dubious distinction, I guess, of being on the council when the wetlands ordinance was modified, if you will, and went through numerous numerous ordinance changes over a, quite some period of time. Uh, at that time, it was discussed, and as it's now becoming more of an issue, uh, it was, Capes is, more restrictive than the state's uh, current requirements for setbacks in wetlands areas, etc. Uh, it was pretty much understood that there will be situations and cases where that may have to be modified. 
One of them, as Mary has cited, is potentially in the BA zone, uh, which is encompassing the Good Table, Rudy's, the new Joel Fitzpatrick development, uh, and conceivably my new center if I change the use or add attended uses to that property. Uh, so I'm just here to encourage that the council may look into and Mike could probably give a better idea on what's involved um, to try to hasten that process, if you will. Uh, I think it's going to be necessary based on, once again, the economic development. If we can keep businesses here in town, especially in existing business districts, I think that's going to benefit of all, all of us. So thank you. Thank you, Carl. I didn't mean to preempt you. Oh, no. No, no, that's or fine. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the council? We're just not used to having people here, so. Um, but Mike <coughs> could explain, um, I think maybe give a little more background and then explain what would be involved. Yeah, we, we, we just received uh, an opinion today from uh, Michael Hill in the town attorney's office uh, that, that Mary Page also received uh, that, that basically said that uh, the uses of the Rudy's and perhaps some others in that area uh, are all within the RP1 setback. So therefore are non-conforming uses and cannot be expanded upon uh, in any way, shape or manner. Uh, that, you know, at the, at the time we, we have a pending application from uh, Rudy's of the Cape. We also have a, a a workshop agenda item, I'm not sure we actually have a pending item, uh, from the Pearsons, uh, who were hoping to, uh, as I understand it, they're leasing the, the business property there at uh, Jordan's Farm Market, and they were hoping to put in a, more of a nursery and more of a, uh, la a landscaping business and a real estate office as part of that. If, you, if you're not aware of that property, in addition to the Lawn God Garden Center, there's also a couple of buildings in the back, John, John here and his son, uh, whose first name is, is escaping me for a second. Mark, Mark, Mark thank you. Uh, Mark, you know, they've had a, a business there for, for many, many years. And, you know, it, it really comes, the issue is if we're to, if we're to have a BA system there, that, a, a BA zone that works there, you know, no matter what may, one may think of individual proposals, but to have a BA, uh, zone that works, it may not be compatible with all the current provisions with the setbacks with the RP1. One of the issues that was discussed in the comprehensive plan was looking at that issue. The planning board has been looking at the issue of the BA zone. It's high on their implementation list along with bed and breakfast. Those are the two things that at the top of their list. I, my sense is that this letter today gives more impetus to looking at that and to getting it back from the planning board when that will come back, I'm not sure. The difficulty is that it, w it would require an amendment to the zoning ordinance, and under the, the town rules, any amendment to the zoning ordinance has to either start at the planning board or has to be referred by the council to the planning board. They need to hold a public hearing. It comes back to the council. The council needs to hold a public hearing. It's, it's, it's not a process that happens overnight. You know, to me, the, the best process would be for the planning board to be aware immediately of the letter that came out today. I'm not sure if it was sent to them uh, yet. I just received it uh, late this afternoon. And, uh, you know, I, I think they really need to look at the viability of the BA zone uh, in terms of is it viable if every use in it is really non-conforming because, you know, businesses need to evolve. We already, you know, the lobster shack is a non-conforming use. They can't expand at all. Uh, we have the small BA zone down by the cookie jar. Th those businesses are, uh, are really challenged. And we have the businesses here in the town center zone, which is not the BA zone. But it, you know, we really need to look at the BA zone if it's a viable zone, if in fact everything in it is, is non, practically everything in it is non-conforming. So uh, the planning board needs to look at that and get some recommendations back to the council relatively soon. Okay. Questions for the manager? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I, I think, in, you know, just to, in, my sense is there'll be some discussions over the next few days with, with Maureen and then with the planning board chairman to try to get some more guidance on 
on when the planning board will look at this and uh, you know, hopefully when a pack of recommendations will come back looking at, at the BA zone as it relates to uh, the, RP, the RP zone that's adjacent to it. So my, my guess is it's, it's a matter of a couple of months probably. Uh, it would be May because the, the planning board needs to look at it. They need to, they need to hold a public hearing. So the earliest it would probably come to the council would be May and then the council would need to look at it and hold a public, public hearing, hearing and we're probably looking at uh, summertime. Okay. <laughs> okay. Further questions now? The next item on our agenda is item 42 which is the report from the ordinance committee and uh, Sarah, you have um, I know uh, Cynthia was planning on giving this. Cynthia, I guess, is the chair, but she's ill, so you could. Um, <clears throat> Jim, I hope you'll jump in and interrupt me when I forget large, important items. But basically, um, the history of it is this. A citizen in town was interested in putting up a windmill on his property, and he went to the planning board, and they um, drafted a plan in which they, they suggested, in fact, encouraged <clears throat> the, the ordinance committee to alter the ordinances in town to allow um, any person to put up a residential, a windmill on their property anywhere in town. And they presented it to the ordinance committee. And we um, were extremely interested but a little tentative and nervous about changing ordinances all across town for people to put up windmills when we really honestly ourselves had never even seen one so um, we took a deep breath and paused and thought maybe the prudent way to go would be to um, put up a windmill on town property or change the ordinances to allow a windmill to go up on town property so that the citizens in Cape could get a feel for what it would be like they could listen to it hear it get out watch it get used to looking at it and then maybe from there we would talk again at some point about allowing windmills um, on people's properties. We then took a field trip down to Saco and we looked at a 30-foot windmill um, by their public works building and a 100-foot windmill that they have right smack in the center of town in front of the new train station and that was, I thought, extremely interesting um, in every way and I encouraged people to go look at it uh, and came back and we then redrafted <coughs> an ordinance which would um, alter the rules in town that would allow a windmill up to 100 feet to be placed on town property. The, the transfer station kept coming up in our conversations, but later in my alternative energy committee, they, they cautioned against that because they said, before you put up a windmill, you really need to put up these small devices that measure the uh, consistency and speed of the wind before you put up a windmill for obvious reasons. You got to put it in a windy place or it's not going to do any good. Um, so that is sort of the gist of what we have here before us as, a, uh, as a, an alteration to the ordinances. Um, and I would just add as an amendment that the Alternative Energy Committee is extremely excited about this, not surprisingly, and they're poised and ready to research all of the windmill technology out there. And believe me, it's becoming extensive. Um, and interview some firms that build these things and come to us with a proposal of what they think would make the most sense, both where to put it and what windmill. So, with that being said as a background, I... Can, should I make a motion now or should I ask... should I, make a motion and then... I um, would move that we... Um, that the ordinance... Uh, that the ordinance amendment set forth in our packets, item... 42-2008 be set for a public hearing on Monday, April 14th at 7.30 p.m. Second motion. Any further discussion? Anne? I have some questions. Um, and i look to Sarah or Jim. I, I couldn't, I read through this, the, the text three times, and I couldn't see where this zoning amendment, if you could just point it out to me, where it would permit the installation of windmill on town property only. Is it in here somewhere that I'm just missing? You mean that it's that it's that it David, states David that it's exclusively no. town property? Yeah, David's shaking his head no. Is that, is that your I question? I was going to raise exactly the same thing. I felt like I was missing a page 
Okay. Yeah, I, I don't see where, well, if I could just continue. I don't see where this language says it could go only on town property. My second question, which is, I don't know if it's a rhetorical question or not, but if we restrict this so that it's just on town property, yet we don't have the money to put up a windmill, aren't we in effect saying no windmills in Cape Elizabeth? And thirdly, um, could you tell me if, if there's anybody who spoke for or against this at the ordinance committee meeting? You, know, you mean, you mean outside people, not our committee? Yeah. Um, Brigitte was there from the alternative. Uh, Brigitte and what was the other gentleman? Uh, Ted Hawks. Ted <coughs> Hawks was there, and they both spoke highly in favor of it. Um, in favor of restricting it to town property? Or just in well, favor, in fa of, in favor of, of trying it. Because I'm not against windmills, but I, I'm just not seeing how this is achieving what we think it might be achieving. If it, if it would result in a positive cost benefit, mm -hmm. it is likely there would be a developer, a, an energy type company that would be willing to or want to make a proposal to the town. Really? I, okay. I think I don't, if, I don't know, but only if it results in a positive cost-benefit analysis for for him, so for his company. Uh, yeah, I, so I see it, I, and I agree with the. Uh, I had a concern too. I didn't see it, but I thought maybe I missed. Marion, I, I would like to suggest that that this be referred back to the ordinance committee. Uh, you know. I think it's covered in the definitions and in the use thing, but, but I don't know for sure, and I think we need to tie that down. Secondly, I don't usually speak substantively on any zoning ordinance amendments. I, I seldom do. But to suggest after, I, I specifically, I had to drive back from New Jersey yesterday, and I, I ended up going up Route 1 through downtown Saco. And it just happened that I was waiting at the traffic light with this windmill shadow coming over my car and, and making a racket. <laughs> it is the ugliest. No, I, I, as reporters say, this will get covered in soccer. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's simply not compatible with Fort Williams Park. And not Fort Williams. It's uh, no. no, it's listed well, here it's as, listed as maximum as every... wind energy height, all uses center of turbine in the Fort Williams Park yes. district. And, you know, I, 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 just I as Sarah said, I would encourage you to go to Saco <laughs> and see if you feel that this is compatible for Fort Williams before you set a public hearing on it. Of course, you could. I'm sorry, Sarah, go ahead. Um, it's true. It's extremely loud. I was kind of unnerved when we got there. But I have to say that I brought that up in the Alternative Energy Committee, and they said, no, 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 that's not, there's, there's many, many kinds of windmills out there. You don't have to have the one that Saco has. In fact, they said there's ones that are made of fabric and they look like kites. And then some, one person said there's a new thing where instead of having one gigantic, ugly one, you have lots and lots of little ones that you put on the roof of structure. So like maybe the high school would have 10 of these kite-like things that are not so high. In other words, I, I don't think, I think, we had this conversation and we said, how high should we make it? And then we were saying 100 feet, that, sounds, that, that feels pretty gigantic. And then we decided not to hold back the project by limiting the height, but rather to make it broad in the context knowing that we, it would come back to us probably several times and we don't have to approve a 100-foot windmill. So that the ordinance was specifically designed to be broad so that it would give the people researching it some leeway and creativity in exploring the best option. It doesn't mean we have to have Sacco's windmill in front of the IGA. Is, is there a restriction to town property in this language somewhere? It's right on the first page here in the memorandum. Does that count as part of it? No, it's here? no. I that's the it. memo, no. but where in the ordinance? Oh. What the ordinance previously lacked was, uh, were definitions of municipal use and wind energy systems. <laughs> These two definitions that you're looking at uh, on the second page of the memorandum are new to the ordinance. The uh, well, yeah. The, the first page, page of the ordinance. First, first, first page, page of the, of the ordinance. ordinance. Yes. Uh, those are new to the ordinance. But. And it was Maureen's opinion uh, that by inserting these definitions, we would create the opportunity to uh, erect windmills on town property. 
that that was her opinion that she, whether that's uh, understood clearly it isn't understood that way by by a few people on the well, council so I, I, I agree maybe with we should go back. probably should go back let's go back do i have to okay to so uh, you can withdraw your motion and make a motion to refer it to the ordinance to the ordinance committee Okay, I, I'd like to withdraw my previous motion and rather move to uh, refer this back to the Ordinance Committee for the next time I meet. Okay. Second. And the other, motion, <laughs> no, the other motion was seconded, and I'm assuming that that second to withdraw was, was yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. so that we don't get ourselves all tied up in procedural knots. Any further discussion on referring it back to the Ordinance Committee? Oh, I'd like to say one well, thing, and that is that um, we have to, when we're looking at alternatives, alternative energy use, and alternative ideas about how we do business moving forward, I think it's really important to keep be open-minded and to um, not, tr not to try to um, garner all the details up front. In other words, when you have a public hearing and when you have a committee that's working on this sort of thing, you need to give them time, those types of things time to work and work out the issues. And, and I'm sure the issue of noise, the issues of aesthetics would be raised, you know, at, at various times. But I think it's really important to keep in mind the goal. You know, the goal is to reduce our reliance on foreign oil. And we all have to do something to make that happen. And I'm not saying this is the only solution. It isn't. In fact, there is no one solution. We have to do lots of different things. And, and we have to get serious about it, and we have to move forward on this, because it will never happen otherwise. And there's always going to be a reason why we can't do it. So I'm suggesting that it can go back to the Ordinance Committee. But I'm suggesting as we move forward, let's keep an open mind and let, the, let it run its course. And we'll, we'll gather information. We'll find out what's good and what's not so good. And we'll come to better consensus. But my concern is that if we focus just on aesthetics or what have you, or noise, and that becomes a blocking objective uh, or, or issue, um, we'll never get anywhere. And, you know, if you look at off the coast of Nantucket Island, for instance, they have perfect wind conditions for windmills. But because people object for aesthetic reasons, then they can't get anywhere. And I, I just see us go round, going round and round, not just not here, but in our country. And I just don't think we're going to make any headway. And, and typically it's the same people that complain about the war in Iraq that aren't willing to move forward on some of these other issues. And I'm just quite concerned about that. And maybe more so than some because I have a personal stake in it um, with my, my kids. But um, I just ask you to be open-minded as we move forward. Let's look at the issues and not just you know, focus on one, one piece of it. Further discussion, Jim? I, I just add on what Paul said, uh, the purpose of the Planning Board's recommendations was to not have the ordinance be the impediment to adopting one power. Uh, they wanted to create something that was, was open enough so that people could look at it, like Paul says, and investigate and weigh the options. Uh, and I, you know, I agree with what Paul says there. Uh, but I can see where you, you would want a little more definition in there as to what, what town property constitutes and, and so forth. Uh, just as a point of information, the uh, the two windmills that we checked, the smaller of the two, which was at the Saco wastewater treatment plant, was 35 feet tall. That was more in line of, of what would be a residential windmill. The uh, sound that that puts off is uh, approximately 55 decibels, which is about the same volume as a vacuum cleaner. So if you get away from the vacuum cleaner 20 yards, well, 50 yards, you can hardly hear it. it, it when you're right next to it, you can definitely hear it. And if, if I had a windmill that was within 50 feet of my house, I'd be concerned. But uh, that's one of the things that has to be talked about down the road. It's something we, we're not going to decide here tonight. We're not going to decide when we approve the ordinance. 
Uh, it, it's something that, as Sarah and Paul both said, uh, we're going to be dealing with piecemeal as the, as the ideas come up. We'll have to decide. Ann? I, I just want to be clear, since I'm the one who brought up the questions in the first place, I'm favorably disposed towards wind power as, as a concept. I just couldn't understand how this ordinance language was going to do what it said it was going to do in the cover memo, which was my concern. Um, and I'm also concerned that if we, until Mary Ann's comment, that if we said you could only do it at the town, but we all know that the town has got some budgetary issues going on, um, and if the town or somebody couldn't afford to put it up, then we were in effect saying no wind power, and that's in town, and that's what was concern, of concern to me. For so I think, if, yeah, well, so, but I, I think if it goes back to the ordinance committee now, the committee has heard some of our other concerns, and we'll move forward. It's a big subject, so, you know, it's an incremental thing. But I'm excited about it. I think it's pretty cool. Further discussion? Okay, all in favor of re-referring this to the ordinance committee? That would be 6 zero. Thank you. And could I just add that a request that the Ordinance Committee consider why, and I think one of the reasons it was confusing to look at this, is that under Residence A, Residence B, Residence C, um, under all the different categories, there is a reference to yeah. um, Max a maximum wind energy mm -hmm. system height of 100 feet to the center of the turbine. Why, is there, why are there references in all the residential districts to the use of a windmill or a turbine if use is not intended to be permitted. I may be wrong, but I think the answer to that, David, is that uh, town-owned property occurs throughout the town. And uh, according to Maureen, I think we had to include all the, the different zones to make the municipal use uh, valid. Because it applies private. If, if, if perhaps the ordinance committee can just clarify. Or, or maybe the whole it. section of the ordinance. I kept feeling like this was just the new pieces of it, that I was getting just the new pieces, and maybe there's a lot more to this section of the ordinance, and well, I wasn't getting the context. The, the, which this discussion, I think, points at the need for the ordinance committee to look at it again, because I don't think they intended that it be a, a, a permitted use at Fort Williams. And the fact that there is town-owned land throughout the town suggests to me that the Ordinance Committee may want to take a little tougher approach to on what town-owned land this would be a permitted use. I don't know if we want to do that at this point. Okay, well then you can bring it back <laughs> at your peril. <laughs> okay. I just have one more thing. Repeatedly in the ordinance committee meetings, we kept saying, this has to pass by the council several times. We're not, this is only to open the gate for exploration, and, and it can be nixed at any point. And that's why they, they, we chose to keep it broad. Yeah. Okay, well, okay, now you might want to choose to make it <laughs> not so broad. Clearly to get by you. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm trying to keep an open mind. <laughs> um, the next item on our agenda is item 43, Town Council Goals, which are in your packet and we have worked on them at a couple of our workshops. So if I can have a motion and then we can discuss them. Move to accept. Second. Second. Okay. And is there discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Okay. We see that would be 6-0. Thank you. The next item is item 44, the updated bond resolution. And this is to um, amend the language to include funding for the Hannaford Field bleachers, which were approved at our last month's town council meeting. So if uh, I can have a motion. David. I move that we approve the uh, amendment to the bond resolution um, in the specific format as included within our town council packets, the essence of which is to permit the bonding of an additional $150,000 for the town share 
of the cost of acquiring and installing bleachers on the school fields um, and which would increase the amount of the bonded amount uh, to $2,550,000. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All in favor? One, two, three, four in favor. Opposed? <laughs> Two opposed. Oh, I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah, well, Cynthia's sick. It's a good thing two of us didn't have the flu. We'd be in trouble. Okay, the next item is our um, item 45, the 2009 proposed budget. And uh, the town manager has a proposed budget, so I'll turn it over to him. Yes, I am asking you to re refer the proposed municipal budget and the special funds budgets in the school budget upon its arrival uh, to the Finance Committee for review. And you have a budget to give there's out a, to us tonight. Yeah, there's, I, there's a, <laughs> the municipal budget, if you, yeah, okay. is up uh, a proposed 4.88 percent. There's a budget message here. Uh, it'll probably get posted online tomorrow. Your, your full budget books will be available probably around Friday. Uh, this is very hot off the presses. Uh, the, the special funds budget, interestingly enough, is down uh, when cumulatively uh, $63,727. I only wish that the general fund. Uh, it's a ray of good news. Yeah, so. Uh, In an evening of bad fiscal news. Okay. But these are here if you'd like to have them, but you'll be getting the full books. Uh, on, on Friday, but uh, they, I'd like to thank uh, the department head, say I look forward to working with Finance Chair Rowe uh, and the rest of the council uh, as we uh, seek a balance of uh, the, the needs of the, for the services and the citizens' ability to pay. Thank you. Jim, may I have a motion? Yes, indeed. I would move that we uh, both receive the proposed uh, fiscal year 2009 budgets and refer said budgets to the Finance Committee for review. Okay, is there a second? Second. Discussion? Uh, seeing none, all in favor? Okay, 6 0, Ruthie. And item 46 is the annual alewife regulation adoption. Is there a motion? Ann. I move that we adopt the alewife harvesting regulations for this year. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? David. Although you probably all saw it, there was a fascinating article in Sunday's, the uh, Portland Press Herald Sunday Telegram um, about alewives. And if you missed it, it would be worth looking for it to read it because it provides a great background on alewives and their role in the ecosystem the, the eco in what the ecosystem <laughs> and the, the right main economy <laughs> okay and the resistance that exists in certain parts of the state and why the resistance exists to permitting alewives to spawn back up into freshwater bodies anyway great article Before okay point. thank you david all in favor that would be 6 0. Thank you. Um, item 47 is the regional forensic lab, and uh, it is recommended to refer this proposal to the Finance Committee for review. Michael, do you have anything else to yeah. add? I see the chief here. Just too. very briefly, the chief and uh, the yes. president of the Greater Portland Council of Governments, Paul McKenney, you, know, you come up, uh, Neil, well, it's like it was. Uh, <laughs> have been uh, working on this proposal uh, for the Metro Coalition. Uh, Chief uh, Neil Williams will give a, a brief overview of the proposal, and, and I would like to say ultimately the recommendation will be to refer to the Finance Committee because there are some fiscal implications. Yes, thank you, and I did hear uh, Councillor McKinney uh, briefly discuss it uh, earlier at the beginning of the session. But uh, I think it was probably about a year ago, year and a half ago, Chief Burton from Portland PD had an idea. The uh, gymnasium that's in the police department in Portland was being was not being utilized at all and they wanted to know what to do with the space and uh, I think his evidence technicians and himself uh, kicked around an idea of uh, possibly 
throwing out to other communities the idea of a regional lab. And this day and age, uh, with crime going on, the only lab available to us is the state police lab in Augusta. And that's quite frankly being overwhelmed. And so we thought that to serve this uh, area better, a, a regional lab might be the way to go. So the idea was uh, brought together through GP COG that, that got us all together, the chiefs, uh, it also touched uh, base with other entities, with fire chiefs and for other reasons, but uh, brought all the chiefs together and we talked about this regional lab. And it all went off well and everybody thought that it was a great idea. Uh, what we would do is uh, bring any equipment, any and all equipment that each department had and bring it together. And therefore, some, some departments have uh, higher technology equipment than, say, we do. Um, we do information sharing uh, by these pass-throughs that we have monthly, but this information sharing would be daily. And um, like was referred to earlier, um, criminals don't have borders. You don't have criminals in Cape Elizabeth not go to South Portland, not go to Portland, not go to Scarborough. For instance, um, car brakes, which is, seem to be a popular item out here. You can listen to a radio and hear car brakes start in Scarborough, then go to South Portland, and then, start in Cape, and then come to Cape Elizabeth, and then go into Portland. Uh, on the radio, you could hear that. And uh, so we know that the same group, so to speak, is doing the same crime only in different towns. So we figured that uh, if we could put this crime lab together, not only could we um, solve it through evidentiary means, but we could also solve it through word of mouth. It just seems to work better. So the idea was really embraced uh, at the GP COG and through the chiefs, and so an interlocal agreement was put together and a cost-sharing formula was put together, and I believe that's uh, with you tonight in your packets. Uh, to my knowledge, eight other communities have agreed to buy into the concept, as well as the Cumberland County Sheriff's Department. Um, I mentioned earlier that the state lab is, quite frankly, overwhelmed up there, and so the idea was brought to Colonel Fleming, and Colonel Fleming wrote a letter to the uh, GP Cog Metro Coalition in support of our idea and what we're doing, and thought it would be a great idea for the southern part of the state. Who is Colonel Fleming? Colonel Fleming is the uh, Colonel of the State Police, who oversees the state lab. So it's before you tonight to take action on it, and uh, I, I personally endorse it, um, and I think it's a great idea, and it's a, it's a show that uh, regionalization uh, in this particular forum we think will work. Thank you, Neil. Are there any questions for Chief? Ann? I, I had a few. Um, you said that there were eight other towns, or including the county. Have all these towns already approved it? I guess it's going around town by town. To I, sort of I would say it. most of them have. I know, for instance, Westbrook is uh, discussing the item tonight. Okay. No one that it's gone, no town that has gone before so far has disapproved it that you know of? Not that I know of. Okay. And then how much do we use a crime lab? We in Cape use a we crime in Cape, lab now. We in Cape use it obviously less than anybody else. We, we don't have those quote unquote high profile crimes. However, we would get a lot of information through just word of mouth and information sharing, but it would also allow us to do more. It would allow us to have the facilities to do more fingerprinting, so to speak, uh, and, and do more photography um, with, with other departments. Uh, we utilize South Portland now for our accident reconstruction, and um, we also utilize them sometimes if we have something that we feel is high priority that we should have uh, looked at by an evidence technician. Okay, and there was one, one last question. Somewhere in this memo, I can't remember where, it said that March 1st, there was a March 1st approval date, and I didn't know if that was, if we're referring this to the Finance Committee, um, if it was a problem, if we hadn't 
figure this out by March 1st? I think they want to know as soon as, the, as, soon as possible, um, but we can only do so much, and I, I think by referring it to the Finance Committee is um, probably the appropriate thing. Okay, so it's not going to, you know, destroy the whole deal. I don't We're believe. We're not opting out by not replying by March 1st. I do not believe so. I'll, I'll give them a positive feedback, and uh, we, we go from there. Thank you. The, mm -hmm. the advantage of having a March 3rd meeting, we have four finance committee meetings prior to the next council meeting. Okay. So the, the hope is this would come back to the next council meeting on April 14th. Okay. Thank you. Jim. Uh, Chief, in your opinion, this was a cost-effective move for the town? I think it is. I, I think we Given reap our low use of, of lab. I, I think we reap a lot of benefit out of this. Uh, we've been on the lower end of our evidence preparation, and I think uh, by the equipment that will be brought together by these other larger departments, um, Portland, for instance, has has an APHIS machine, an automatic fingerprint system, which will just be just great, great to have access to whereas we don't really have day-to-day -day access to that right now. You see us using the lab enough to make it cost-effective? I, I believe so. Thanks. Sarah? Can you just give us a grocery list of what it provides? Um, I mean, not every detail, but the big... No, so, uh, some, of the, some of the equipment is video enhancement, hardware, software, um, the APHIS system, um, a fingerprint processing chamber, um, optical comparator for your fingerprints, um, for, for viewing and, and comparing fingerprints. It will give microscopes, it will give a uh, place for uh, vehicles to be um, processed and, and not far away from the lab. Um, we see. get blood alcohol test results a lot quicker? No not blood alcohol test results. I, I do not believe they're going to be doing that there. There may be time to expand, but the other thing that we're getting that we don't have now is their training. Training for evidence labs is extremely expensive. I mean, you have to send a person away for three months, four months to train on this piece of equipment, whereas we're going to be utilizing that information from say Portland, say Westbrook, and uh, so, so that particular piece of equipment will be able to help us. Also, the, the um, um, training that that person in the other department has, we technically get their training and not pay for it. I have one more question. Yes. Um, I know we have some estimates of payments of what this would cost on a yearly basis. Are there any um, costs that we'd, we'd be saving? Is, am I correct in um, assuming that we would be using this lo more local crime lab instead of the state crime lab for when we use crime lab facilities? Mm -hmm. So do we currently have to pay to use the state crime lab? What we do with the state crime lab, and when we take evidence, we have to drive it up there because you have to have continuity of your evidence. And instead of, instead of taking the um, chance of shipping it and losing that continuity, we drive it up. Today's fuel prices, I would say yes. Okay. But the, the state crime lab doesn't charge us anything for the use of their it, lab or their testing? Yes, uh, they, they do charge us, and, and, and I think that the charges would, would be the same, so to speak, although we'll, we could be doing most of what they do up there. Um, the problem is, is, is getting it there, whereas we would definitely take that particular evidence into Portland, whereas sometimes it just doesn't get up to Augusta as, as well. And, there, and the other thing is, is, is the, the time constraint. Mm -hmm. if, if you have a low priority case, Augusta's going to put that on the back burner. Thank you. Further? Yeah, oh, there are. Okay, David and then Paul. But just as a follow-up to the questions that you've been asked, is there, a, is there a line item in your budget now for sort of evidence or uh, sort of crime lab-related expenses 
We do that under miscellaneous uh, equipment, that, that line item. We, we take uh, that and uh, contractual services. Um, like we take our, our marijuana and <clears throat> cocaine and heroin up to the lab. It costs approximately $110 to test that, just one, one case. And so we take it, we, and we take it out of the uh, miscellaneous contractual sometimes. So what do you suppose um, your sort of total annual expenditures are for the use of the crime lab today? Whoa, that's a, that's a tough one to answer. Um, you know, I, I, I think that uh, you're taking the detective's time and uh, consumables and then his time to drive up there, I think, would probably be in the area of four to five thousand dollars. I think. What, what does that four to five thousand dollars represent? An annual expense. An annual expense. However, with with this, don't forget that we're acquiring the the training and the higher. I, well, I don't know if it's the higher. It's higher than we have, but the technical equipment that, that we would have in Portland. And it's also being in one area for the surrounding communities that really deal with the problems throughout that surrounding, those surrounding communities. These, these are great questions for Neil, but I'm wondering if they're more appropriate for the Finance Committee, mm -hmm. since the motion is to refer it to the Finance Committee, and some of you are really getting into the nitty gritty of the finances on this. I don't have a question, but I have one uh, basic well, comment. Is that everyone else spoke, so <laughs> go right. for it. You can do that. Um, well, all I want to point out to my fellow counselors is that um, although we live in Cape Elizabeth, the vast majority of us work outside of Cape Elizabeth. And therefore, we're subject to the crimes in the, in the region. You know, my, like my, my office is in Portland, for example. So whatever happens in Portland is going to affect me. It's going to affect other residents of Cape. So when we contribute to something like this, we're contributing to something that's good for the region and therefore good for us. Okay. And if I may, if, uh, if it does go to the Finance Committee and you have questions, it would be easier to email me some questions so I could have it and be advance. prepared for you. Right. Good. And uh, well, you'll have a schedule of when we're looking for the police budget, and we'll do that then, I assume. Uh, I'm not chairman of that, so. <laughs> 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 okay, Neil, thank you for thank you. coming. Sure. Further discussion on the reference to the Finance Committee. <laughs> All in favor? That would be 6 0, Ruthie. Motion, however. Oh. Did we have a motion? Well, it was a good vote. I move that we refer this to the. I thought we had a. I thought we did. I thought David did you? Well, I'll second the previous one. <laughs> oh, Ruth's very good. I trust her. I trust her over the rest of us. So. Okay, all in favor? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ruth, for keeping us <laughs> honest. Um, this is that time of the uh, meeting for citizens' discussion of items not on our agenda. So if there is anyone who would like to bring up anything else, seeing none, I will mention before we adjourn that the Finance Committee will be meeting here at Town Hall in the Jordan Conference Room at 7.30 on March 25th, March 26th, April 1st, and April 9th. And the next regular meeting of the Town Council will be on April 14th. And with that, a motion to adjourn would be in order. So moved. Second. Non-debatable, all in favor. That would be 6-0. Thank you very much.